Welcome to another episode of Stone Nation, a production of Park Media. Before I introduce today's guest, don't forget to hit that subscribe button, share, and leave a five-star review. And if you find this podcast useful in any way and want to pay us the ultimate compliment, head on over to our Patreon page where you can subscribe to be a classic, stealth, or beast mode subscriber. So what are you waiting for? Head on over to the Patreon site where you can literally support this podcast for less than a cup of coffee per month. Welcome back to another episode of Stone Nation. Today's guest is Toby McGraw. Toby and his wife Shelly currently live with their two children in the Los Angeles area, but the family is originally from Elkhart, Indiana. Their kids are currently in first and third grade, and Shelly is an active room mom at their school. Toby leads the revenue team at the tech company Hop Skip Drive. Toby also attended the University of Southern California, and the family loves cheering on the Trojans every opportunity they get. In 2016, they moved to the Seattle area and then down to Southern California in 2018. While in Washington, the family fell in love with visiting national parks, and as their kids got older, they spent a lot of time hiking, biking, and camping in the national parks and national forest land. Toby is an avid hiker who aspires to climb Mount Rainier, Mount Whitney, and the Half Dome this summer. During the winter time, the family enjoys skiing together, so much so that this winter they traveled and camped at 11 different ski mountains across five different states. You can find Toby on Instagram at justanothervanfam, and you can also find Toby on Facebook as Toby McGraw. So let's give a warm Stone Nation welcome to Toby McGraw. All right, Toby, thanks for joining Stone Nation today. Hey, happy to be here. Thanks for oh, having me. Yeah, I'm really excited that you're on. Um, I saw some of your pictures, and it looks like you've been go- doing great stuff out there. Yeah, it's been a lot of fun. I mean, some of the, some of the things that, that we really love about it are just the general versatility. Mm-hmm. And so whether it's just, you know, that one day we want to go to the beach or whether it's leaving for a week-long road trip, it really, we've we've been able to do a little bit of everything with it. That's great. Yeah, the versatility is one of the main selling points. So how long have you had your mode for? And w- well, let's back up. What uh, what year and what model do you, ha- do you have? Yeah, sure. So we have a 2021 uh, classic mode. So we, uh, we ordered it in July of 2020. And this was right when we started to see wait times going crazy. Uh, we waited about three months for it. We thought at the time it was only going to be about three weeks. It was right when it was the model changeover, uh, but it wasn't delivered until the beginning of October. Those 90 days felt like the longest possible time we could imagine. Right. Looking back on it now, we don't even remember. We don't even remember the wait. So yeah, we've had it. We've had it now just about five months. Okay. And before you got, uh, before you pulled the trigger on the mode, were you looking at anything else, or did you know right away the storyteller was it? Yeah. So, I mean, I, I think what the, the Revel, the Winnebago Revel is what caught our eyes initially. And I, and I know a lot of people see that it's just, it's a vehicle that's, that's, you know, there's a lot more of them made at the moment. And so you see them a lot of places. And so as we'd been exploring some national parks and other areas here in California, we've started to see, you know, these vehicles more and more. And so we started to, to do some research and, and really liked a lot of the things that we saw with it. Um, and I, I came across the storyteller, uh, actually on like an RV trader type site. And I thought it looked really cool. It's just from a price point perspective, it was at the time, like a 25 or 30 grand, uh, premium to, to what we saw in the rebel. And so, you know, there, there was a while we were just kind of looking at the rebel. We're looking, can we find one used? And, you know, this is like May or June of last year. And all of a sudden inventory is going from places have 30 vans to, to zero vans with wait lists. And so uh, we happened to to get a call from a dealer down in San Diego that they had a, a rebel that um, the financing basically had fallen apart. And so that they had something on site. Uh, we drive up to the to the lot and the, the first thing that we saw there at La Mesa was a, was a storyteller mode sitting there. And we're like, man, that, that, looks, that looks really nice. And so we walked in and, and just the, the openness and just the amount of light and things that we got into it really caught our eye and thought it was just a beautiful looking van. I uh, had a chance to go then to look at the Rebel. And really, as we started, you know, going back and forth with some of the some of the features, it was just for our family, the, the, the mode was just a much better fit. What exactly was a better fit for with the storyteller than the Revel? 
Yeah. So, you know, to, a little bit about us. So, you know, we, we travel, it's my wife, we have two sons that are seven and nine and, and we have a 12 year old Basset Hound as well. And so it's a, it's a full, it's a full van of, of bodies at a given moment. And so w- with, uh, you know, a couple things that I had challenges with, with the rebel from day one was what were we going to do about the seatbelt situation for the kids? Uh, and so the, the bench seat on the, on the earlier model rebels only had lap seat belts. I think on the, the newer model year, they ended up having one, one shoulder belt and then one lap belt and so from day one i was just trying to figure out what are we going to do for for this seat i'm going to have to do some kind of aftermarket aftermarket modification to to add you know two shoulder belts at the same time the the sleeping configuration while the 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 drop down bed in the rear of the of the rebel sounded really attractive um we were trying to figure out can we actually sleep somebody on this second seat what happens a lot of times is wife and the two boys are are sleeping in one bed and then i get the other bed so i'm I'm looking (laughs) at the kind of convertible bed option that's in the rebel and it just wasn't it wasn't going to work for me personally uh, and so when, when we got a chance to look at the storytelling, actually looking at the, the Groove Lounge, for me, I actually prefer to sleep there because, you know, I'm, I'm almost 6'4". The ability to kind of stretch out is something that, that means a lot to me. And so uh, it was just for, for, for those couple of reasons, it, it made a lot of sense for our family. Beyond that, when we really started looking at the Volta power system, just the ability to go completely off the grid. You know, I, I think I've plugged the, the van in one time in the five months that we've owned it. And it was just a test more than anything. It's honestly more of a hassle to dig out the power cable <laughs> and plug it in than, than what it's worth. Uh, and so for us, it's like, you know, if we're hiking or, or, or camping or doing something in the summertime or we're leaving our Basset Hound Otis in the, in the van for an extended period of time, we wanted the AC uh, for him to be able to run. We didn't want to worry about, you know, a two hour time limit or anything like that. Um, and, and then also, you know, just one of those things that as, as we were comparing it again, I, I was asking the, the sales rep, I'm like, hey, does the microwave on the Rebel work, you know, with the, with the inverter or not, like trying to understand, he's like, oh, wait, I don't think there's a microwave. And it's like one of those things that we hadn't even noticed, where it was like, you know, and, and it's something where we, we do, I mean, we're weekend warriors. We, we travel most weekends somewhere. And there's a lot of times, you know, we left the day after Thanksgiving and we just had a refrig- refrigerator full of leftovers of Thanksgiving leftovers. And this, the ability to, to pop those in the microwave real quick was, was another little added benefit that, that we didn't even realize we would have been missing uh, on the Rebel. And just, we, we had no interest in having to carry a backup generator or do some of those other things as well. And so, you know, really the seating was, was super important for us, but, but also just the overall power system. And, and then the fit and finish and, and the look of the mode, I mean, those all absolutely stand out as well. The, the, the openness, the brightness, and there are a lot of things aesthetically uh, we felt like were, were a, a step up from, from the Rebel itself. It does sound like a really good fit for you guys. Now, with a family of four and a 70-pound basset hound, what is it like to travel with that many people or, I should say, body space? I mean, what do you do for stores? Do you have any tips or tricks or um, some type of routine that helps you guys? Yeah, I, I think, uh, you know, we, we have a saying or we're continually saying it's like there, there's a place for everything. Everything has a place. Everything has a place. And so I think the most important thing is, you know, you have limited you have limited space within a van. And it's, it's really challenging. You end up having to stack things on top of each other, especially when you're, when you're going from drive mode to, to camp mode. And so for us, it's very important to understand where does everything go? And so when we take off shoes and we get to the van, where are we putting them? And so for instance, it's like my shoes and Thomas's shoes, they go in front of the driver's side door when we're down for the night. My wife's and Luke's go on the other side. And so they, they go in front of the seats. And, and so it's one of those things where we start to understand, okay, where does the dog food go? So when it's time to feed the dog, we know exactly where to go. And more than anything, you know, it's all about maximizing space and, and just like the quick efficiency. And the more you're having to move and stack stuff, you're just less and you're going to be more and more irritated. You're going to be less and less likely to use the product to, to actually go out and enjoy it. And so for us, it's just like the most important thing has really been make sure that everything has a place. And so, you know, one of those early annoyances uh, early on was just trying to understand, okay, the, the window shades, where are we putting those? You know, they, they don't take up a lot of room, but they're this, you can't really stick them anywhere. They're slack sliding off when you're driving, they're sliding everywhere. And so, you know, learning from a lot of the other members on the, on the Facebook group, just seeing, you know, how, how much benefit you can get out of bungee straps or bungee cords. And so it's one of those things where on the underside of the, of the bed now we, we have bungee straps. And so bungee straps hold our window coverings, bungee straps, hold our camp chairs, uh, window straps or bungee straps, hold our, our, um, black tank or a gray tank, um, 
uh, hose and, and all those different things. So we've tried to maximize the, the top part of that co uh, storage compartment uh, to, to make sure that we have easy access to things down below it. And then we have a lot of the stuff that we maybe use a little bit less uh, on the top side of that storage compartment. And so for us, just making sure that we are maximizing and we're on the same page with where everything goes. Coordinated uh, efficiency and organization is a must with that many people in one van. Are, do you have any other tips or tricks for that? So, I mean, I, I, uh, not, not, not really. <laughs> you don't have any really. uh, storage bins or sliders or organizational um, tools that you use other than yes. the bungee cords? Yeah. Yeah. So I would say, you know, we, we do, we do a lot of the, the Home Depot style, you know, black and yellow crates that, that you see in a lot of vans that, that we are stacking up in the back, uh, which has been super useful. And I think just making sure that we're labeling which on which, which is in each of these crates has been super, super in, uh, effective as well. Uh, one of the things that, that we're looking for, and, and, and I've been kind of looking at other members on is just trying to understand for, you know, some of the toys that we're hauling, uh, specifically like bicycles, like some of the better solutions there. Because there's four of us looking for a, a a solution for a four bike bike rack has been something. You know, we, we've we've I, I early on, and this is again going back to last summer when everything is sold out from bikes and bike racks and everything else. Like the the only bike rack I could get in time was is like Allen Allen Sports four four uh, four bike rack, and and I hate it. It's just it's not <laughs> been it's not been a good oh, solution no. at all. And so we're out there like really like researching what we've seen, and and a lot of the folks you know the. I'm, the, the owl gear has been really, really cool. And so the, that B2 carrier is something that, that I've been super interested in. Uh, and, and I think the, the way we might use it is, is to do the, the, the swing away bike rack on the hitch with, with the B2 on top. And I saw someone recently had posted that in the group and I'm just and like the double, double bikes uh, is, just, is just something I think would be great for, again, for, for someone like us that, that's carrying that. Um, the other thing that we ended up doing, uh, so we, we ski a lot. So we've, we've taken the, the van to 11 different ski mountains, oh, wow. uh, over the last, uh, over the last three, uh, three months or so across five States. And so we did a really, uh, a huge road trip around Christmas, New Year's time, uh, from Southern California up to Oregon, then over to Colorado. We got a chance to hit Jackson hole then back down through Salt Lake city. Uh, so we, we've, we've been able to ski a lot of places and I, I we kind of like, where did we want to put the skis? And initially we were kind of finding space with them uh within the van themselves uh we we're looking at a couple of hitch hitch options but because we have such a you know that that front runner roof rack has so much room up there we ended up getting a, a toolie uh ski rack that, that we put on the top and so just climbing up getting the skis up and out of the way ha has been super useful there is some you, you're a little bit space constrained of course because you have you know up on top you have the solar you have the ac and then that the fan unit uh, we were able to, to to find a solution that really fit just between the ladder itself and the fan unit uh, a couple of the skis are of course going to go over parts of the solar panel uh, but i don't think it's a it's a huge degradation uh, of what we see in, in terms of like daily uh, usage for the electricity so it's been a really nice solution for us as well so are there any other mods on your wish list yeah, for sure on the wish list. I, I think one of the next things, like the, the suspension itself, I mean, that's something we see a lot of people upgrading. Uh, I, I do think, you know, there, there's just a lot of, you know, it's very rigid, a lot of bounce in, in that stock system. So looking at a couple of different options that are out there, there's a couple of good solutions, as you know. Uh, are you to upgrade leaning the suspension. toward one or the other? I, I'm not at this point. I, I haven't gotten enough into the details to really to understand myself to understand the pros and the cons of that. And so this is likely where I'll, I'll be tapping on the shoulder of, of someone else within the group to try to understand, you know, what they recommend between the agile and some of the other options that are out there. Um, I, I for sure want to go with the Rentec uh, auto tuner. You know, I, I think I was like heard so much about the turbo lag and so much about, you know, the, the lack of power and things like that. I was really I was concerned when I first got the van, decided to give it a little bit of time to understand. For the most part, it's it's not like a it's not to me a serious safety concern. Like some people tried to make it out to be early on where it's like, oh, you're just going to get in the traffic and it won't go anywhere. Uh, but there are times when, you know, it's a it's a it's a mountain pass where it's a long uphill grade where, you know, you got the pedal to the metal and push, you know, holding 65 or better is, is, is tough to do. And so I, I would like to, I do like the idea of that Rentec auto tuner to be able to get a little bit more horsepower when we need it in, in those circumstances. Uh, so that's, that's certainly on our wish list as well. Um, you know, besides like uh, the, the suspension as, as long as well as the upgraded tires and wheels, just a little bit bigger look. 
um, something that looks a little bit more beast like without without the beast <laughs> price tag right. uh, that, that again looks looks really really sharp that's that's something that, that we're looking at I think eventually as well just with our with the two boys um, looking at the kabunk system is is something that, uh, that that we are we would definitely like to do I haven't yet done like the van wife shelf I know I know a lot of folks like that we've loved the idea of that extra storage again being taller I'd like to I'd like to walk around a van that has it first before I pulled the trigger on that so hopefully at one of these these future meetups, I can, I can check out someone's rig that, that has that van wife shelf. Yeah, most definitely. That'll help because you never know with your height, if you're going to be bumping your head a lot, but, uh, yeah, yeah. There's like the one cabinet that I smack my head on all the time is the one that's directly above the groove lounge. And so uh, it's like, whether I got like the bed down and I'm fiddling with something, but I, I mean, that's the one that I'll <laughs> hit two or three times. It's, it's enough of a bell ringer that I, I don't want to, I don't want to make it much worse with more low shelves. So we'll I see hear how you it on works. that one. Have you guys used a shower at all? Yeah. So, um, I, I have personally, so there's been a couple of trips that, that I took solo that were, you know, you know, off the grid for a week or so at a time, uh, where, you know, it was important to, to use the shower. And, and again, being taller, like, I've had no issues with that whatsoever. Um, it, it's a tight fit. Don't get me wrong, but you know that I like the the fact that there's a shower curtain versus a hard shower cabinet, like you might see in some other options. Why and is so that? I, um, just like I can just kind of stretch out, and it's not like when you're in that enclosed box, you're banging elbows, you're kind of ducking down, and and really, as I like going back to the revel, as I like stepped into that bathroom unit, because the idea of an enclosed bathroom sounded really appealing. I go into that thing and it's just, I don't, I don't fit. And, and so the, the, that halo shower, you know, it's nice because it pops out. There's plenty of room. Uh, I, and I've noticed, you know, you, when, when I, when I have showered, um, super hot water, good pressure, like all those things that, that you want. And so for like a, for like a camp shower, uh, when you've been out in the wilderness for three or four days and you can knock it out real quick, it's, I mean, there's just nothing better. Uh, so yeah, it's been great. So you don't have any issues with the headroom when you're in the shower and in the shower pan and all that? So, I mean, I'm, I'm like, right. I'm like right there. I'm, okay. I'm, I'm like right there, but it, it's not to the sense where it's, it's not like a sharp angle, like right around it where I'm like bumping my head on something. And I mean, honestly, I'm my, my entire life. I've, I've showered at places where there's like shower heads about here. And so I'm having to duck down anyway. <laughs> and so that's, that's, you know, it's, it's you, something you get used to as a, as a taller person. And so, uh, and just again, understanding that, that this is a, a 19 foot van and this isn't something like you have to make some, some compromises somewhere. And so that height is not something that's been a meaningful impact for me. So it's safe to say if, uh, you're six, five, six, six, then you might be having a duck a little bit if you're taking the There's shower. No question. Yeah. Okay. And it, w w it, within the whole in inside of the van, I mean, when, when you start, when you're at that little, like it's, everything is going to be taller. And so it, it is, you're going to have to be a bit more crouched down. For sure. Gotcha. Now, what about the bathroom situation with four people? Do you guys use a cassette toilet or how do you figure that situation out? Yeah. So, you know, this, this is one of the things that we were uh, concerned about early on as well. So I, again, going back to the rebel, something I liked about that, that's also a cassette toilet, but you can access it from the outside. You weren't having to, you weren't having to like carry the waste through the vehicle. Um, the, the reality is, you know, so often we're, we're at, like a lot of the times, you know, and we've camped everywhere. Like we, everything from boondocking to established campgrounds, to RV parks, to, you know, sleeping at rest areas and, and, <laughs> and, uh, gas stations and other things as well. And so, so often we're, we're using public facilities when it makes sense. And so a lot of the times we're using that, uh, and other times when, when we've been off the grid where, you know, especially one of the kids needs to, to use something, uh, we, we went and picked up the clean waste go anywhere bags, uh, that you can get at REI and places like that. Uh, and so we'll, we'll set that down it, that has like the, 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 um, the I don't know, chemicals or whatever it is within it that actually will turn stuff kind of into a jelly. And so it's, it's like, not like it's all flopping around. And so the nice thing about that is it can be used a few times sealed up. It closes really easily. You know, this is something that I've used before for backpacking trips and things like that. Uh, so it's a, it's a really easy thing. The double bag sealed, there's no smell. Uh, it's it's been really really useful for us, and it fits right within our cassette toilet, and so there hasn't been a need for for any any additional changes there. So I didn't like the idea of having to pull the the entire toilet out to to dump it or anything like that. And so that that's what we've used, and it's it's been it's been terrific. Okay, and what about the privacy issue? Do you guys that some of the people I talk to, privacy is not an issue because they're totally comfortable, but you know, yeah. I, 
I'm comfortable, but at the same time, when I'm doing a number two, I'm not comfortable, if that makes sense. <laughs> yeah. And, and so, you know, again, this will, it'll a lot of times depend on, depend on where we're going. Um, you know, a lot of times if, if there's the ability to step out of the van, that's obviously, that's obviously the best, you know, there are other times when, you know, we've been in sub zero temperatures and one of the kids has to go. And if they have to, you know, if nature's calling, you know, you gotta go. And so, you know, it's, it's a matter of turning on the fan. It's, it's having some other ambient sound going on. Um, for the most, like they, their little feet might be sticking out as they're, as they're uh, <laughs> underneath it. But no, I mean, we're, we're, we are all comfortable enough. I mean, we spend a lot of time together in, in tight environments. And so, um, yeah, it's a, it's a, you know, it's a little, it's a little uncomfortable, but it, it again, in a 19 foot vehicle, like you're, you're going to have to do things like that. And so we've been able to overcome it. It hasn't been a challenge. Right. And I think you touched on a point in regards to, there's always a public bathroom closer than you know it. So if you have to do a number two, I feel like going somewhere not in the van is a good possibility the majority of the times. Yeah. And, and you, we also, you also get kind of disciplined in your, in your approach where it's like, okay, like when we, when you're near a bathroom, use it. Right. And so when you're, when you're filling up the diesel or the DE, like whatever, like that might be your opportunity to, to go and, and knock that out. Or, you know, as we're driving down the freeway, we see a rest area. It's like, Hey, who, who needs to use it? We're checking the map got 30 miles until our stop. So we're stopping regardless whether you say you want to use it or not. So it's just getting more disciplined and making sure that's part of your routine. Uh, and just to get rid of that, that kind of concern of uncomfortableness. Right. So mm-hmm. out of all the trips and the mileage that you put on, um, well, first of all, what's your van's name? So the, the kids from the very beginning started calling it the tan van. And so we, we it's the pebble gray, uh, mm-hmm. classic mode. And so they started calling it the tan van. Um, and, and over time we just kind of started calling it Stan the tan van and Stan the tan if it, yeah. And if he's ever given us trouble, we, we might call him Stanley, but uh, yeah, Stan, <laughs> Stan the tan van is, is what we've been calling him. So out of all your adventures in Stan the tan van, what's the one thing that's really surprised you the most since owning it? I, I think just like the, what, what I really love about it, it's like, and I touched on this at the very beginning, but it really comes down to the versatility. And so, you know, we, we live in Los Angeles where, you know, 20, 25 minutes to the beach, there are times that we'll just take it for a beach day. It fits in normal parking spots. We don't have to park in an RV lot or park, pay extra for parking. So, you know, we will do some stuff where it's just simple day trips where we're biking or beaching somewhere. In other cases, you know, we've done, you know, thousand mile road trips where we're putting on eight or 10, 12 hours in a day. And really, you know, most of the Mercedes components are pretty comfortable for a longer drive, you know, things like the adaptive cruise control and the lane assist or departure and all those different things. Uh, it's really, you know, a lot of technology in a van that, that makes it, you know, pretty user friendly to drive. Uh, and then there's times where, you know, we're, we're on complete backcountry forest roads where you want to have your all wheel drive engaged. Uh, and, it, and it's up to task. I mean, we, we've driven in a lot of different environments, snow, ice, mud. Um, haven't had issues with it so far. I'm probably not as back country as some of the people that I see. Um, we're, we're not with the recovery gear and, and everything just yet, but um, I, I would have no issues driving it just about anywhere. And so I think, you know, and, and again, living in the city, it's, it's small enough sometimes where, you know, I actually got rid of my, our, our second vehicle. So this is effectively, you know, my daily driver. Oh, wow. And so if, if I have to go to the grocery store, or have to pick the kids up from school, like they're, they're actually in, in person for a little bit right now. Um, it, it's something that does the trick. And so what I really love about it is just, it's much more versatile than, than I might've thought. Uh, especially as, as you know, someone that's kind of new to these larger vehicles, it, it, lo- it looks and feels really large at first, but as you start to drive it, it really, it, it drives like a, like a truck or an SUV. It's not like, it doesn't feel like you're driving some, some large, you know, type A motorhome or anything like that. So it's really been that versatility and the ability to do a little bit of everything that, that I really appreciate. So is there anything that you don't like about it? And I'm going to split this up into categories. One is about the chassis and the other is about the actual RV portion. Yeah. So, I mean, the, on, on the, on the Mercedes Benz chassis, I mean, obviously the, the power steering thing is something that a lot of people have had issues with, you know, we got in and, and had our power steering clamp adjusted when the recall came out. Uh, it was something we, we did right away. And I mean, we were 13, 14,000 miles in, it was actually a couple of weekends ago, I'm driving up to big bear 
And just as soon as we got off the main freeway, I'm starting to crawl up up the 330 up to Big Bear. I, I feel tightness in my in my steering wheel. So mm. uh, pulling over, I just assumed like the the solution wasn't what it wasn't addressed like I expected. Ended up having the tow truck come, and you're dealing with all that. You know, it's a it's really a, it's a hassle to deal with that stuff. Um, we, we took it into to Walters in uh, Walters Sprinter Service in Riverside, California, and it turns out it was actually as a faulty hose. And so there had been some swelling of the hose itself. Um, that's what that's what had actually caused the leak. It had nothing to do with the clamp itself. And so similar issue, but unrelated. But that, that's one of the things that just feels like there there needs to be a better a better solution on. Um, I do think that that some of the 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 rest of a lot of the Mercedes issues, the Sprinter chassis issues, you know, it's an echo chamber. And so you hear a lot about you know, and people are looking for advice and looking for help. They're, they're not necessarily griping about things. And so you just start to hear like, oh, Mercedes issue, Mercedes issue. And so. Uh, I think that people, you know, that they have, some people have a negative um, impression of it. B- besides that, that one incident, I've had zero other issues with, with the chassis itself. Um, you know, w- with, like, like I said, I, I for sure want to get the, the Rintec auto tuner to get a little bit more power when we're going up those long grades. Uh, but the rest of it has driven really, really well. And I've been, I've been pretty happy with, with most of the Mercedes chassis. And so, um, you know, I, I know there's some folks that are, that are hoping for a Ford Transit version, um, which, which may or may not be a great thing. Uh, time will tell. There's, there's obviously so many more sprinters on the road at this point that it's, it's just, it's an unfair comparison between the two. So, um, completely understand why people might want to wait, but from my perspective, I'm, I'm sure glad I didn't because I, I've, I've loved the chassis side. That's good. What about the RV side? What are some things, if you're the chief designer, that uh, you would change? Yeah, I mean that it's a tricky question because there's there's so much of it that, that we really really like. There, I don't I don't know if there's a lot of additional things I, I would bring to bear. Um, you know, I, I I might say that. Well, first of all, I, I because so many people identify the the suspension as a as a reasonable upgrade, that that feels like something that maybe in time becomes part of the the base mode. I, I would have definitely paid a little bit extra to not have to do that aftermarket and, and take the time and, and, and pay that separately. And so that, that's certainly something that I think is in time, you start to see that suspension being upgraded on, on even the base models. Uh, besides that, you know, the, you know, back to the toilet area, the, the, the shower pan itself is a tight space. So there's not a lot of other options to upgrade to a, to a little bit larger, l- larger seats. And so if there's a way to, to figure out whether that's re- I, I don't, I don't, I don't, if you could increase that space without losing the flexibility of your, of your groove lounge, I, I think that there's certainly some, some opportunity there. Uh, the, the bed itself, you know, I, I think, uh, the, uh, the, the rear, the rear bed, that that's something that I, you know, I've seen a, a few po- folks that have done the, the add on. So you can actually sleep with your head to the rear doors. You know, I think that's a, a really clever approach for, for again, someone like me that's taller and, and don't get me wrong. I can fit on, on the big bed, but it's like at where my, my head and my toes are kind of both touching at the same time. And it's, and it's not as comfortable for me. So I'd prefer my toes to be hanging off a of bed anytime. And so like the ability to have that, that bed go the other direction uh, on that Murphy style bed, I, I think would be, would be uh, super helpful. Um, yeah, but besides that, I mean, we've, we've loved most of the other things uh, associated with, uh, with the vehicle, with, with the RV itself. So mm-hmm. what are some tips and tricks, uh, that you do on the road in regards to cooking inside the van or do you cook? I don't know. Some people yeah. eat out all the time. <laughs> yeah. So we, uh, we, we cook most of our meals, you know, we, we, we do eat out from time to time, but we, we try to do no more than one meal outside a day. And so, you know, over Christmas time when we took like a 14 day road trip. Uh, we, we, it's, it's fun to eat out. Right. And so we would certainly do that, but never more than once a day. You need to save a, a lot of money doing that. Uh, and, and so for us, it's, you know, we have, a, we have a couple of different storage options for the food. We don't put any of the food in the overhead compartments. We have separate little containers for them. We have one container for the hard stuff, one container for the soft stuff so that bread's not getting smashed and chips aren't getting cracked. Um, so it, it's just kind of like separating the, the two different types of stuff and then understanding when you're, when you're needing to find where's the canola oil, you, you know, which one to actually look at. Um, besides that, I mean, we, we will plan meals ahead of time. And so, you know, let, let's say it's, it's hamburgers or something like that. Prior to leaving, we're going to, we're going to slice the tomato. We're going to get the, get the lettuce ready and all those types of things. So that, that when we, I, I carry a Coleman tailgate or grill. And so I'll pull that thing out and we, you know, we'll fire up some burgers. And by the time I'm bringing those back in, like 
everything has already been done, right? So all the all the stuff has already been chopped and ready and prepared to go. And so that's that's been super helpful um, for us in in winter camping. You know, we, we've we've gotten a lot of a lot of when when you can't really use outside. Uh, we've gotten a lot of uh, use out of meals that are that are pre-cooked and so it's more about reheating than it is actually cooking so we we rely on that on that quite a bit and that's where the microwave or even the stovetop has been has been super useful uh, for us we got the the magma induction set that has like the four or five pans together that fits in that lower shelf and it's a really it's it's a great it's a great set of uh, of um, pots and uh, pans and i mean it's super easy to clean and, and just all those things take away so much of the headache and so yeah for, for us it's you know about making sure we understand where where things are at uh it's preparing and and doing the pre-work as much as we can and then you know in colder temperatures we're, we're relying on some kind of uh, pre pre-cooked kind of uh stuff quite a bit that's actually a really good idea to pre-cook everything so all you're really doing is just reheating Wow. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And so it saves on cleanup as well as just overall time. You know, there'll be times where we, we skied, you know, 25,000 feet of vertical. We've been skiing for nine hours straight. Kids are getting hangry and <laughs> they're ready to eat something. And so being able to, to turn around a meal pretty quickly is, is important. So yeah, we've, we've found that to be useful. Now on your longer road trips, do you have any traveling tips in regards to like where you decide to stay or do you have everything pre-mapped out? And if you do, like what it, what's your criteria for, to stay the night there? Because I'm sure, you know, being a father with your family, safety is your number one priority. So how do you choose where you stay at and any tips for those with the same situation as yours? Yeah. So, I mean, I've, I, we've, we stay a lot at, at rest stops and, and like loves type of truck centers and so there are times where, you know, we'll, we'll have some days where we're leaving at 4 p.m., we're driving somewhere for six or eight hours. And so it's just a matter of finding a, a well-lit place that's that's pretty secure. And so the the, the roadside, you know, uh, travel centers have been something we've been super comfortable at. It's really nice because a lot of times there's, there's nice restrooms and facilities. You can top off your diesel or, or do whatever you need to do and then get up and early, out early the next morning. And so uh, we, we, we'll leverage that a fair amount and then we like to mix in other ideas so if it's something where we're going to spend an afternoon we certainly like to map that out ahead of time uh, we've used harvest host quite a bit uh, that's been a, a really neat option to be able to see some different things and a lot of times those those areas are those um the, the harvest host will have facilities and so you can you can use restrooms and things like that and so that's been something that's been super helpful for us um, and just from a cost perspective, a, a lot cheaper than, you know, some of the RV parks that you stay at are 60 or 80 bucks a night. And just to, to me, not a very good value when you can park down the road and you're hardly using much more with it. And so, yeah, when we're, we're on the interstate though, it's, it's primarily rest stops and, and places like that. What I've been super impressed with, with the van is like, it's super quiet. And so such a, such a great amount of insulation. In it. And so by the time you button up all your windows, and you're going down for the night, like even in an area where there's a lot of traffic or things going on, it stays pretty quiet. That's good. Yeah, it's really, really quiet. And uh, usually the only thing that makes noise is the stuff that you have inside the van. <laughs> so true. So true. Yeah. Like, what's that new buzzing now sound? <laughs> like, yeah. yeah. Um, so for those that are looking at either the Revel or the Storyteller, what's your advice to them? Like what kind of resources, what kind of questions should they be asking? I think the most important thing is just like trying to understand what is what is your specific use case. And and if it's if it's a circumstance where, you know, like if we were two people instead of four, if we were continually plugging in, like the the rebel would have would have made more sense, right? So I think it's really understanding what your use case is. Uh, we did a ton of a ton of research, you know, not not only in the Facebook, the Facebook lounges. Um, there's, there's, I mean, just, just Google things and you'll, you'll go down a lot of different rabbit holes. There's a ton of resources on YouTube. And so really like trying to understand it, uh, for us more than anything is, and unfortunately right now it's really hard to give the advice to like, go look and feel and, and see it in person just because there's just, both of these vans are so popular. It's hard to see one in person. Um, I, I would say like going back and if I was, if I was telling someone like to go see one in person, 
I'd, I'd probably go to a ski lot and walk around and you're going to see one of these vans strike up a conversation with the owner and see if they'll let you take a peek inside. Uh, and it's, it's just a very different feel uh, within, within a Revel and a Storyteller just in terms of the overall openness and, and, the, and the fit and finish and all those things as well. I think you can, I think you can, people will have a preference one way or the other. Um, so that's, that's, that's what I would say, like do your best to, to, to look and feel if it's not at a dealer, go to somewhere where you see adventure vans and, and see if you can't uh, pick someone's brain. Uh, what's been really cool about becoming a part of the, the overall kind of van life community are that that people are very friendly they're they're always willing to help each other out uh they love to kind of talk and pick pick brains uh you know every time we are we're sitting in a in a ski lot with with the van uh you know we might be sitting outside like drinking a cold one or even getting boots on or whatever people are walking nice van what is that what year and they're they're just always asking they're just super approachable and so what's been really neat about that this entire community is just how much people work work with one another and so you know i would just encourage folks that if you're on the fence between the two go, go talk to a couple owners there's enough adventure van expos out there uh there's there's other places where these groups are getting together so i think that's just a tremendous learning opportunity uh from those of us that, that have it and we're always willing to, to show them off as you know <laughs> that's great advice are you open to if someone uh, DM'd you to try to look at your uh, storyteller? Are you open to showing them in case they can't? Yeah. You know, nice. yeah, absolutely. So, like I said, we're 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 in the in the San Fernando, we're in Sherman Oaks in Los Angeles, and uh, definitely always willing to uh, to share. And and again, and we like I said, we travel most weekends, and so sometimes we might be in your neighborhood. <laughs> so, um, yeah, we're we're always willing to do that, though. That's. That's very nice of you. Um, so you kind of answered my last question and how I like to end every podcast, which is what does it mean for you to be part of the Stowe community? Yeah, I mean, I, I just think it's it's the the um, like I'm inspired every single day by by the work that, that people are doing. You know, I, I've seen some of your mods uh, with, with your mobile office in the van, which are, which are super, super cool. Uh, but everything from just, you know, ideas for modifications, just inspiration for great places to, to park and camp, uh, just, uh, to overall, you know, events to be a part of it. It's been really, really neat to just, to, to, to be around other like-minded people that are doing everything they can to, to get outside and, and to enjoy, you know, the beautiful, the beautiful world that we live in. And so uh, to me, that's, that's been the, the coolest part of this entire experience is just getting really inspired daily uh, from, from people that, that, so, and some people that have been, you know, living van life for, you know, a lot, lot longer than, than us. And it's just, it's really great to learn. And, you know, there, there's so many of us that are, that are new to, to RVs that are, that are new to, you know, kind of that, that type of the, the world. And, um, it's not something that, that you learn in school. And so the opportunity to learn from other folks within the community has, has been really, really awesome. And everyone's just been incredibly helpful when you have follow-up questions. Hey, do you have a picture of this? Like they're, they're quick to respond. And it's been, it's been just awesome to be, to be part of, part of that. And I, and I really appreciate the people that have, have gone to the plant, uh, in Alabama and just the storyteller team itself seems super receptive and, you know, we've, we've had, you know, the, the CEO, Jeffrey Hunter, like reach out to us on Instagram on different things. And so it, it's neat to see the way that they've embraced their, their users. I totally agree. Um, well, Toby, I do appreciate the time and I'm really glad you are part of the Stowe community and coming on to the Stowe Nation podcast. Thank you so much. It was a, a pleasure to have it. Thank you for, uh, for doing this podcast. I think it's fantastic and I can't wait to, to see and hear more of these. Stone Nation is a production of Park Media. The executive producer is Young Wa Kim. The audio engineer is Stephen Grasso. The marketing director is Guillaume Golson. The original music and artists is done by Jason Walsmith. The sound designer is Lorenzo Interiano. And the assistant sound designer is Peng Shu. Without any of these people, this podcast couldn't happen. So a big, huge thank you. And a big, huge thank you to you, the listener. If you like this episode, please don't forget to subscribe, share, and leave a five-star review. This is Young Wall with Stone Nation, and I can't wait to share the road with you.